you're famously quoted often as saying the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. This perpetual toggling between nothing new, you say, under the sun and everything having very recently changed absolutely is perhaps the central driving tension of my work. I don't know if you remember saying that. Yes. Can, can you expand on that? Um. Well, I, I have that, you know, as a, as a sort of ordinary sense of my waking, waking day. That you know, I'm in, I'm in the the eternal world that humans have been living in almost forever, and we're not, we don't seem to be that terribly advanced in terms of how we deal with one another. We're still doing appalling things variously around the world every, every day. And simultaneously, I'm waking up in the morning and uh, poking at my iPad mini and seeing that someone in London has just remarked on the weather and posted a photograph of the sky. So I suddenly have this, this and they, that they did it the minute I woke up. So I'm suddenly looking at the sky in London that some stranger, stranger took and, and described in a, in a rather poetic way. And it's all instantaneous and people never did that before. And that's all happening on top of, <clears throat> That's all happening very near the apex of a pyramid of once emergent technologies that might have, say, at the bottom, you'd have, have growing cereal. And above that, you'd have cities, which you can't do unless you can grow and store cereal. And above that, you'd have sewers without which your cities die of, above a certain population of of cholera and dysentery. So we're up at the apex. If any of those other layers below went out on us, we'd all die. We forget that, that, that we're at the peak of, peak of something, but we're supported by older technologies that we no longer even think of as, as technologies. So, and I think maybe professionally, I have some awareness of that every day, or I try to have. Are you frightened by that? Well, I'm, I'm anxious by nature. I, I think, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm one of those, those sort of hyper-vigilant people, uh, except when I'm on those, on those occasions when I'm when I'm relaxed, but uh, it's a bit scary, but so is life, and it's, it's, it is what it, it is what it is. I think of what I do as a, a, a species of naturalism, not that it's, yeah. not that it's predictive, or, or trying to be prescient, but that I'm simply trying to describe a, a, a sometimes incomprehensible present with the tool kits of science fiction and futurology, which seem totally appropriate to this particular present. Yeah. I, I think we're on a, a speedway of technology now, and I don't know if that's going to continue, but it has been for the past maybe 10 years, for me, that you, you don't have anything you can play anything on anymore, you know? And it makes small bits of trouble for novelists because in Victorian novels, the calling card falls behind the bureau, yeah. and somebody's life is ruined, and you could write that book for all your life. And now, if you, I had a student who had, uh, everybody had flip phones in her novel. By the time it came out, those were like antiques. She might as well have had them playing records on gramophones. Yeah. 
kennt. I have, I have a lot of sympathy with that. I, I think if a, if a 12 year old were reading Neuromancer today, she'd get to page 20 and go, okay, the whole plot hinges around what happened to all the cell phones. <laughs> Not prescient. <laughs> Yeah, I remember you saying that in some interview that you, it was a real uh, oversight. Uh, who could have predicted that? That we'd walk around and be available to everybody anytime. That was... No, no one. <clears throat> but more, more interestingly, I think, is for a thought, if you want a, a kind of difficult thought experiment, spend some time trying to imagine what it would have been like if somehow someone back in 1963, some science fiction writer had received in her sleep a completely accurate vision of our state of cellular telephony today. And she, she wrote a novel that incorporated that vision and took it to a publisher and the publisher said, Are you insane? Yeah. The characters in this book spend all their time looking at these tiny, yeah. tiny television radio things in their pockets and writing letters on them and playing Angry Birds. <laughs> and they're never alone. No one is ever alone. What will people make? I, I wonder, really, I've been wondering quite a lot recently, What will people make in 20 years of all the fiction ever written in which people are mostly alone most of their lives? Yeah. yeah. That the, the, uh, the solitude will be incomprehensible. I remember the year, I don't know which year it was, in, in London when the solitude went away. I, I went to London in the fall and I remember standing on standing on a platform somewhere in Kensington waiting for the train and looking at the English people not speaking to one another and not making eye contact as was their want from time immemorial. And I went away and I came back a month later and they were all on cell phones. Yeah. It just changed overnight. That solitude above London flew away. And, and I thought that was the moment. The, extraordinary thing for me was that I had actually seen it, seen it happen. No, no one now remembers the night that they turned on the broadcast television in New York City, but you know it changed everything. Yeah. And it, it's never changed back. Do you think cell phones will, I mean, you didn't predict, predict them. Can you predict <clears throat> their demise? I think that they will, you know, assuming that If this goes on, you know, I, I think we'll probably internalize them as the the characters in the further future have done in the yeah. in in the peripheral, and they they have them implanted. They don't know exactly where. They're sort of the technology is distributed, and they experience them as a sort of uh, internalized head-up display where you, you, see, you see who's calling you. you, you see their sigil. But I actually had to develop that technology because when I started the book, I developed a much more fully realized idea of fully internalized cellular telephony that makes that look really primitive. But what I found was it was so distracting and took the, took the reader so far away from the narrative that it was just impossible to use it. So I deliberately cranked their technology back, I figured it was about 30 years, yeah. in order to have something recognizable yeah. to, to a reader today. I, I remember, and, and I, I, I never could figure out how it worked when Twitter first came out, I think it was in um, Zero History, where they have a they set up a private Twitter account that's, and that was the first time I thought that it has a kind of a lock nobody else can join. Do you remember this? Yes, it's actually easy. You can you can 
you could do that. You, any, any Twitter account can be set, set to uh, private so that, that no, one can, no one can follow you unless you okay them. If two people do that mutually to the exclusion of everything else. Then it's a private line. Yeah, it's a, it's a private line. I thought that was cool. I, st I still have both of those accounts, the accounts they use, because I knew that people would open them if I didn't, yeah. didn't take them. <laughs> well, your new novel, which, uh, you know, you're here on your tour, The Peripheral, uh, does an end run around the blur between the present and future by taking place in a near future and a farther one. A connection is established between the two basically through a wormhole in a video game. Anyway, uh, <laughs> is that, would you <laughs> describe that as, as correct? And, and video games are such that wealthy people ha have players play them for them? Yes. <laughs> well, I have two, two uh, as you say, there, there are two Two futures, it, it's like a double scoop of, of that old science fiction. And one is, one is a near future, which is basically winter's bone with better smartphones, or justified with more drones. And then there's the further one, which is, is uh, my take on, on uh, how badly human beings could manage to mess up the, the uh, so-called singularity. It's like, a, it's, it's a very screwed up singularity. And it's on the far side of, of uh, an apocalyptic event of, of sorts. Although, while I was working on that, is something that, that, struck, that I, struck me that I'd never noticed before, is that our cultural model of, of the apocalypse is unicausal and of very brief duration. So, triffids come, world ends, <laughs> post-apocalypse. Uh, United States and USSR nuke each other to mutual destruction, post-apocalypse. It, like it, it's one thing and it happens. And I thought, what if the, uh, what if the apocalypse were, were, were multi-causal, complexly systemic, it took 40 or 50 years. Uh, actually, I initially thought, what if it took 400 years or 500 years, but that was too much time for my story, so I got it down to four. I got it down to forty. There's no reason why that wouldn't happen that I can see. It actually is a lot more likely than uh, a brief unicausal event. But we, I don't think we have the cultural equipment to hold that idea readily in our heads. It's not part of our mythology in spite of the possibility that we might now already be living in it. And that that fact might account for those creepy feelings <laughs> that some of you have been having, <laughs> myself included. And you call that the jackpot in the book. It's, it's the jackpot. Yes, the jackpot. The jackpot. Um, and when the survivors of the jackpot, who've, who've tended to be able to afford it, when they come out after, I won't go into what saves their bacon, but when, when they come out and see that there aren't that many people left, they, they sort of say, wow, man, we dodged the bullet. That was really close. And the bullet they dodged was, was Malthusian in nature. It was simply that there were too many people on the planet 
to, to continue operating that way. And I think that's the way the survivors of that sort of apocalypse would likely, likely view it. Like, whew, that was tragic, but here we are. Given, given human nature. Yeah, I, I think what you're, I think what you're saying is, is more likely to happen, and that it's already begun. You know, we're just the frog in the water, and the water's getting heated up. But I wanted to, I, this I had further on, but I wanted to ask you now. You and I are um, about the same age. You're my brother's age. And uh, we grew up on the same tropes about the future. Gleaming kitchens and monorails for public transportation. Helipads, we were all going to have a helicopter on the roof. We'd all be deaf. And uh, then somewhere in the late 70s around, I remember the bar scene in Star Wars and Mad Max, the vision, the, the kind of pop entertainment vision went from utopian to dystopian and particularly techno-dystopian, machines gone bad, girls gone wild, machines gone bad, hell. <laughs> what do you think accounted for that shift? Oh, well, it's, com you know, culturally, <clears throat> it's complex. Like the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the first Star Wars film came out in 1977. So it, it was conterminous with the Sex Pistols. And it was like a big, uh, to me, this, this like re appallingly retrograde nostalgia, retro, retro future. It was everything I didn't want science fiction to be, in spite of the cantina scene. <clears throat> And it was riffing, it was riffing on the 1930s Buck Rogers serials that ran every day after school on television when I was, mm -hmm. when I was like four years old. Tom and, Corbett. We're, we're, and Tom, Tom Corbett. It, it, um, so, and I wasn't, you know, I went to, I went to it, but I came out, I wasn't a, a, ecstatic the way my friends were. It's like, I want to go listen to The Clash. This is like, this is the, I want to write, I want there to be science fiction that's like listening to the, listening to The Clash. So that was happening. And at the same time, Blade Runner was in the wings and was uh, and was going to be made. So I think there were, there were two, at least two different modalities of, of pop futurism abroad then, and, and probably, probably considerably more. It, it hasn't been, it hasn't ever really been a monolithic thing the gleaming kitchens and the, the monorail and the flying cars and all of that in the 1950s coexisted with a, a, a strain of, of left-leaning American socio-politically aware prose science fiction, which was being published in contrast to its political opposite. The political opposite was called Astounding Stories, and the liberal sci-fi magazine was called Galaxy. And the writers, there was a little bit of crossover, and they would drink together when they went to science fiction conventions, but otherwise they didn't, they didn't have much to do with one another. And if you look at the, the stories that were being published in Galaxy, they're quite dystopian. And, and grid, grittier and more, more naturalistic and, to my mind, altogether more intelligent, but that's sort of a matter of taste. So it, it's never all one, one scenario, we, we, though we tend, to, we tend to remember it that way. I do think there was a time when we thought things would 
getting better. And, and that evolved into a belief that things are kind of getting worse. And I don't know if that, uh, if that attached itself to, to science fiction or, or not, but I, I sort of think it, it has. Um, now, you know, you're viewed as a guru, you know that. Uh, that your readers view you as a guide to the future, but a signpost that keeps changing as the world morphs into its future. Because, you know, we've had, you know, about 30 years of present that turned into, future that turned into present since you've been writing. As one reviewer put it, writing about the trajectory of Neuromancer, of course, the future was going to be filled with mirror shades and black leather jackets and the film of blood on a wet razor. Why? Because William Gibson said it would be. But in the years since, you created that future, even though it hasn't happened yet, you've already revised and refined the vision. And as one reader puts it, it is no longer the sprawl, no longer Neo-Tokyo, no longer jacked in, drugged up, surviving in stitch punk colonies on a broken bridge, or lounging in the edgiest of designer clubs, but Gibson had found it hiding, becoming here and there in our midst, and written one of those who walked away, those unseen paths, just out of sight of our daily commute. You know, the broken bridge in this quote makes me think of, uh, of New Orleans after Katrina, yeah. where all those people were left on an, on an overpass, which was pretty apocalyptic for them. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not ready to take the rap for for all of that. When I began to write, write science fiction, I knew that imaginary... When I began to write, I began to write... As it happened, I began to write science fiction. But I had a bachelor's degree in comparative literary critical methodology, and I'd read a lot of a lot of modern novels, and as a kid, I'd read a great deal of science, science fiction. So I took the, the contents of my otherwise fairly useless undergraduate degree and applied it to what I knew of, of the history of science fiction. And one thing, one thing that allowed me to see is that when people write imaginary futures, they're never about the future. They are in, they can only be about the moment in which they were written and the history, known history before that. We don't have anything else. We have no access to the future. We can, we can try to extrapolate and we can spin scenarios and try to make, well, future histories that, that seem intriguingly logical, but they aren't going to be anything like what really happens. Now, when someone, someone predicts something that really happens, more or less, and I would say that, that Arthur C. Clarke predicted commu orbiting communication satellites much more accurately than I ever predicted the World Wide Web. But in both cases, we, we tend to, our culture tends to overestimate the hit. Like, yes, he's prescient. Yes, he's a prophet. No, uh, there are all the misses. There's one hit and then there are all the, all the misses that the same the same writer made. Now, I've never had the, the heart to go through Arthur C. Clarke and find all the stuff that he got wrong, but he was human and he could only, he could only get a lot of it, get a lot of it wrong. And un, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I don't know for my having been able to make a living, People who write about imaginary futures, if they get a few hits, are marketed as though they were seers uh, or shaman. Uh, and and uh, 
we're, we're not. As my colleague Bruce Sterling used to like to say rather smugly, we're charlatans. We've joined the circus. And you're throwing money at us because our shills, the publishers <laughs> and their publicists, present us as people who can predict the future. And yet we're, we're not. And should you ever uh, meet a science fiction writer or a futurist who tells you that he or she can predict the future or run. Because you, you've got a live one and you don't want to go there. Do you remember anything you predicted that didn't happen? Well, every time I, I, I don't often reread my own, own work. I could not, for instance, to save my life write a precy of the, the plot of Count Zero. I remember a few scenes. I'm pretty good with Neuromancer because I've had to revisit it very frequently when, when, whenever anyone attempts to make one, one of those uh, abortive attempts at realizing it as a feature film. And so from going back to, Neu from going back to Neuromancer, I... I do, you know, there's a scene in Neuromancer where Case is really, you know, he really, you've, it's very far in the book and, and, you know, the crunch has really come and he needs to communicate really quick. So he says, somebody get me a modem. <laughs> and I can tell you, I can tell you now, this is humiliating. Uh, you know, this is really embarrassing. But when I wrote that, I didn't know what a modem was. <laughs> it was just this word that I had heard computer people use, and it had something to do with, with communicating, c communication between computers. So it makes absolutely no sense in, in the context of the imaginary world world of that book, but I, I was working from the poetics of an emergent language yeah. of uh, around, around the digital. And honestly, the, the first time I heard anyone use interface as a verb, I fairly swooned yeah. at, at how, oh, that's so hot. And, and just <laughs> incredible. And I went right home and I put it in the story. And another time I was standing beside two former WAC Women's Army Corps key punch operators who had worked at the Pentagon. They had to wear sweaters, remember that? Because <clears throat> it was cold in the rooms. Yeah, I imagine these, these women had worn, worn sweaters. And they were reminiscing with one another, and I was eavesdropping. And one of them said, yeah, and they had the guys with that cart that came around in the morning, and they took off those games that people would put on, put on our Univac or whatever it was. And the other one said, yeah, but what, what they were really after was those viruses. And I, I about broke my neck. Oh. Like, I, wow. <laughs> So I, I said, excuse me, but you know, what viruses? And she said, oh, computers can be infected by viruses. They're not really, they just call them that. They're, they're little code things that sort of behave like viruses within the information in the computer. And that was the first time I ever heard of that. And you know something? Probably nobody else in that whole science fiction convention had ever yeah. Ever, ever heard of that. So I was like, I think I'm leaving the con early. I've got some writing, <laughs> <coughs> writing to do because I wanted to get that down before I anybody, anybody else heard about it. And it was about, well, when Neuromancer came out, the idea of, of computer viruses was still pretty, pretty esoteric. 
And for that matter, when Neuromancer came out, the idea that, that Japan was about to own the whole world was yeah. really, a, really esoteric, but it was there. And that's a, another way that I didn't get it right. Uh, but I don't really care. I kind of, I treasure archaic science fiction for those very flaws. It makes it charming and, and deeply, it makes it charming and deeply strange. And it, it demonstrates that it is an artifact of the very moment in, in which it was made, which is really all, all it can be. You can't get really off the hook of having invented the term cyberspace. You're, you're just going to have to live with that, right? Well, I did. You know, I, I, how, I how I came to, to coin the, the word, word cyberspace, which is, I think, I think of cyberspace as a, 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 her, a piece of heritage terminology. And it wasn't when I wrote Neuromancer. But I think that cyberspace is heritage terminology in the same way that the real world, quote, is heritage terminology. The difference between the world into which Neuroman Neuromancer was published and the world in which we, we live tonight is that in Neuromancer's day, in the day of the actual publication of the book, there was cyberspace, this other realm, and the real, and the real world. And what, what's happened, what's happened, and actually it's presented that way in the book, even though it's like something like, I assume, 2035 in the book, People still go, okay, it's the real world here in the sprawl, but there is cyberspace looming beyond the da. So that's gone. And what's happened is that cyberspace has colonized the real world. And the distinction, the distinction is what's going to make us look like hicks to our great grandchildren. That we even think there could be a distinction. It's, they're not, I don't, you know, if we keep going the way we're going, I don't think there'll be a distinction. There's less of a distinction now than there was last year. And... Are you disappointed at all in the web? No. No, I, I, um... It isn't, it's, it's sort of part of the, the marketing, which... You know, it, it, this isn't, it isn't that I've only now come to say, oh no, the marketing is wrong. I, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't regard me as a, as a prophet. I've said that more over the course of 30 years than I've said anything else. I, I, in fact, I've been remorselessly on topic <laughs> with that since since the very, very beginning is that weird uh, anthology of every interview I ever did that uh, has been recently published apparently indicates. Uh, someone who actually went through it all said, said uh, you certainly repeat yourself. <laughs> and quite a lot of it is, is me saying, nope, I'm not prescient and I, and I didn't particularly, I didn't particularly expect to be but I keep watching this stuff as it changes and the distinction between between the digital and the so-called real or the so-called digital and so-called real is is going it's just going away and assuming that we keep being able to make these gadgets and systems, I think it'll continue, it will, it will continue to, to go away. And those who grow up with that 
will regard us with some puzzlement as transitional creatures between themselves and a world before television that they will, they will struggle to comprehend, much as we struggle if we seriously try to comprehend the, the lives of our ancestors in the savannas. Yeah. You know, I have two more pages of questions, but I'm not going to get to ask them because we want to turn this over to the audience. After I ask you a question, I've been holding back, but I'm sure you have an opinion. That is, what do you think happened to Malaysia Air 370? <laughs> I'm still on it. I think, I think of that as a demonstration of the extent to which we are not yet truly post-geographical. I think that that's a demonstration of the brute beingness of geography. And if I, if I had to guess, I would say that it's very, very deep somewhere in, in the, in, probably in the, the Indian Ocean, but the, the Indian Ocean is so damn big and so damn deep that it will be a long time before we find it. And even when we find it, we may not know exactly what unfortunate story that it that it to be there, but I, I think it, it was, I think of it as a, a rupture in our fantastic membrane of hubris about, it's like we imagine our technology as being like, like actually cooler than it is. And when we run into, run in, when we run into a situation in which our, our best Techies say to us, there's nothing we can do. We can just keep looking. It may take forever. Yeah. Uh, it's down in the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> it's too deep to find. And, and it's hard for us to, it, it's become hard for us to get our heads around that. You don't think it's in Kazakhstan? Oh come on! <laughs> I would be su I would be su I would actually would would be surprised. But it's the thing about the thing about conspiracy theories is that in order to propagate, you have to be able to describe them over a, a maximum of two pints of beer. <laughs> no. And that means that they won't, by nature, be, be very complex. And they may, but neither, interestingly, will they be very frightening, even, even if they involve the reptiloid illuminati. <laughs> I hadn't and got that their far. Actual, their actual function in, in that simplicity is to protect us from the really terrifying yeah. realities yeah. Yeah. which are inherently vastly complex. So uh, it's, it's actually less scary to think that, that that plane is in Kazakhstan than it is to think that it's at the bottom of the ocean as a result of some human fuck up that we may never understand. Yeah. That's scarier. Uh, based on your books and on your Twitter feed, you have a big interest in fashion. I actually bought a pair of outlier chinos based on your recommendation. Uh, but uh, what specifically interests you about fashion? Well, it isn't, uh, I don't actually like to think about it as fashion because I think of fashion as a, as a kind of artificial marketing structure where at the turn of every season they jump up and say, oh, you need new pants. But I am interested. I'm interested in 
clothing and haircuts and things like, things that we think of as fashion. I'm interested in it as a language. And sometimes a localized language and some, uh, sometimes a, a, a now a, a global, a global language. And we all communicate to some extent with what we, with what we wear. Some of us pride ourselves on not doing that, but that's not really true. If you see someone who's making an actually utterly incoherent clothing statement, you cross the street. <laughs> it's, even those of us who think of ourselves as resolutely anti-fashion and uninterested in any of that are not getting it that wrong. So, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in, in uh, how people identify with, with uh, counterculture. I'm interested in countercultural identification through garments. I'm interested in the fact that there is apparently always one breeding pair of rockers in the United Kingdom and, and at least one of classic mods and, and Goths seem utterly established and never go away. And those are all modalities of, of identification. I've been sitting with him for a couple of hours now and everything he's wearing is cool. You're, you're not up close enough to see it, but his pants are cool. Jacket, totally cool <laughs> with the snaps. Shoes, I didn't notice till we came out here. And then I got a... Andrew, those socks, ordinary, but everything else. <laughs> I was actually, I shouldn't, this will haunt me, but I have, to, I have to admit it because I think it's funny. I was a branding consultant on the line of clothing that these pants and this jacket are. Are oh. part of, but I can't say what it was because I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't tell you what brand it is, but I actually was, and that was where that was where I learned uh, all the stuff in in uh, zero history that people think I ma made up about about the the. Uh, the hybridization of the military industrial complex and, and the skateboard clothing complex. So that, that, was really go, that was really going on. And if I, if I hadn't have been researching that, I would never have gotten the, gotten the gig. Very strange. But. Do speculative fiction writers are poor when it comes to research and cutting edge knowledge and history? I think that our now has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter. And I think our now, when I was about five years old, was maybe a, a presidential term or half of one. And our now today is, is like a fraction of a news cycle, if that. It's been, it's been shrinking. So back in, back in the 50s, Robert Heinlein, say, writing, writing some pretty carefully extrapolated speculative fiction, had this big flat now to work on and he could sort of arrange the bits. But that's been getting smaller, so the, the thing that was a, the size of two Olympic tennis courts is now like, like a quarter of a, what used to be called a postage stamp. But now itself is kind of on the verge of, verge of extinction. And writers today don't have the, the real estate of now in which to plant their stuff because everything is changing changing very quickly. And, and that creates different problems in, in speculative fiction. And people have to come up with, with uh, different solutions. And one of my solutions is just to accept that what I write is, is 
obsoleting. It's, it's, if it were an ice cream cone, it would be melting as I tried to take it home. It's obsoleting as I write it. Somebody's inventing something right now that will make, make my novel ridiculous. Except, well, if I'm, if I'm really serious about writing a novel, that stuff won't matter and my novel won't become ridiculous because it, its intent will have been, in the end, quite serious. Um. My question is sort of uh, sort of carries on a little bit with what you were just saying about the about the present, and you mentioned earlier that you think um, that science fiction tells you about the moment in which it occurred and the moment that, in which it was published, and I'm curious what you think that science fiction being written and published today tells us about the current moment. Well, I should be careful when I talk about science fiction being published today because I don't actually read that much of it myself. So I, I'm actually very out, out of touch with the genre as a, a, a marketing thing and, and as a marketing mechanism. And when I, if I go into a science fiction specialty shop, I'm just overwhelmed by the the number of titles and the variety, and I, I rely on uh, the sort of personal network slash filtering operation that one develops uh, over the course of a literary life, or if something happens that a sufficient number of my friends find interesting enough to bring to one another's attention, it sort of bumps along until it gets to me and I'll go, hmm, I might, uh, I, might, I might read that. But I did something, I went to a science fiction convention in Vancouver and I hadn't been to a convention, an SNF convention in about 20 years, a little over 20 years. And so I went and I was, I was doing a conversation, something like this, they're less wide ranging in front of us, a smaller audience. And, and so I said, uh, here, these are three writers. Somebody asked me who I was interested in. And I said, well, there are these three writers. And I said, how many people have heard of her? And two people raised their hands. And of him, and one raised a hand. And of him, nobody raised their hands. So I realized that I was sort of walking around in some kind of internet consensus bubble. And I had no idea what these people were reading, and that almost none of them were reading the the, the writers I, I thought were were are really interesting right now who are just getting into it. I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of a strong vein of warning in this new novi, novel. And when other people write these books with these strong warnings in them, the very bad things happen in them. But my question is, why are you so nice to your characters? compared to your peers? It's uh, the, two final, the two final chapters are a sort of litmus test for socio-political sophistication. If you think a woman's okay because she's married and pregnant and has a lot of money, they, <laughs> like, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, a happy ending is about when you roll the credit. There's a lot of bad shit hovering around both those, both those chapters. And uh, particularly, uh, well, one of, the, one of the characters in the penultimate, next to last chapter, essentially has the last word of the book. And uh, she looks out she looks out over the city of London and says, human, all too human. Because she, and that's her answer to being asked why the people in that, the good guys in that chapter, why they might not inadvertently be creating exactly what they think they're escaping from. Which, if you think about it, and I, I, it's too spoilery for me to get into, but uh, if you read it again, uh, which I actually recommend with this book because it, 
works completely differently the second time. You'll, I guarantee you'll see a lot of things you missed the first time, particularly in the first hundred pages. Um, those, I think those two final chapters are the scariest thing I have ever written, the creepiest thing I've ever written. And I've already seen reviews that accuse me of going beyond my known penchant for absurdly happy endings. <laughs> so in your collection, distrust that particular flavor, you mentioned the term prosthetic memory. And from my understanding, your, the recall in that memory, it could be distant or nearby. And these are kind of determined by algorithms like search algorithms or things on the phone and whatever, what may have you. Um, do you have any thoughts on that or well, personal opinion? I have a pocket full of prosthetic memory right, right here. I've got, you know, I don't know how far back the email record I can access on this, this phone goes, but that's prosthetic memory. This phone, when I'm in a building other than this one, can, can access Google, and that's prosthetic memory. It, pro, prosthetic memory is not like, like a chip from whatever Radio Shack is now called, if it even still exists. It's, it's this entire system we're, we're connected to. And as, as someone said on, on Twitter last, last month, is, said, someone said, uh, I'm getting tired of not being able to lose track of anyone. And I thought that was somehow like the, the core statement of, of the entire year for me. I mean, yeah, and that's prosthetic memory. That prosthetic memory is like every, everything you ever did in social media just staying there for the rest of your life. Uh, it's... We, we live in this, this vast mechanism of prosthetic memory that, relatively speaking, scarcely existed 50, 50 years ago. We have been creating forms of prosthetic memory uh, forever, you know, painting on cave walls, working at, you know, notching bones, working... All of those things that animals don't do, that, that we, we've always done, culminate now in the, whatever the hell this is that we're doing, which I tend to assume the end point would just be a single digital now. It would be like a, a, a spherical retina looking in at itself. And some kind, some weird kind of, of digital Borgesian alpha omega thing. And you know, we may we may not get to find out, but one day someone might. There was a there was a piece you wrote. It might have an interview. Might have been a piece you wrote in Wired uh, in the '90s when someone said like you've been accused of creating dystopias. And you said, well, it depends who you are, because if you're like a slum dweller in Bangladesh, all of a sudden a site of a high-tech Bangladesh or whatever, yeah. that's, a, that's appealing. And so um, do you still think that this apocalyptic sense of things are getting worse? It's kind of a luxury of us at the top, and that and actually, no, actually most of the advances are helping most of humanity, so we just better chill out and just accept that other people are. Well, I mean, it, it is in a way. The, the uh, anxiety about having too much anxiety about the apocalypse is perhaps the, the ultimate first world problem. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people, people are trying to, you know, get, get food on the table to keep their children from dying. They're not like, they're not stressing the apocalypse. They're, they're very much in the, they're very much in the moment. And I do think that <clears throat> 
There are plenty, I think there are probably a lot of people in, say, Mogadishu who have offered the, offered the chance to immigrate to Neuromancer would be there in a flash if they, if they could. And they'd be doing, they'd be doing, they'd be doing better. One of the, the kind of uh, secrets, I guess, that's sort of very simple moves I discovered early on in my career, which I'm only sort of becoming willing to talk about the, these days, is that what I would do, what I would do for, for these futures, what I would just take, take the conditions of the third world, transfer them to, say, Chicago, and just run them, you know, just run it straight through, and people would go, ho! Oh! <laughs> How could, and, and yet, there are probably, you know, there are parts of Chicago where that you could zero in on and go, well, that's pretty close. Indeed, it's true. So the people who have the, the, uh, the holy shit, that scary rea reaction to, to neuromancer tend to be very privileged people one, one way or another. And I, that was part of my program, and, and uh, I was hoping that in some way I could maybe change that a little bit by showing it, people this stuff in a different way. Thank you. Thank you very much.